Okay, here we go. Just don't get your finger in it when you close it. And don't get your nose in it. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Morton Quinn right. and Sandra Louise Craig. Palm Desert Historic Society. Okay. Palm Desert? Mm-hmm. It's Palm Desert. This is what it's for. It's for Palm Desert. Mm -hmm. I'll read on. It doesn't, okay, it doesn't, first of all, no one other, no other historic society is really doing this. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, they, it's for, it's through that, but it's not like you have to do the boundaries or anything. Because we're not really affiliated with that doesn't them. matter. We still no, are. That doesn't matter. We have to do all our environmentals. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> your, your time is very limited then. No. It has nothing. It's f through the Palm Desert Historic Society, mm -hmm. and they're having their 50th anniversary. So mm -hmm. that's they're, they're beefing up the interviews for that reason. One year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Harry and Sandy. Mm -hmm. Okay, is this considered pinion pine? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me ask you, start with that first. Um, how, tell me about pinion pines. Is that like a subdivision or? Yeah, it was originally set up by Art Nightingale mm -hmm. about 1928. Mm -hmm. And um, my old cabin was built, according to Art, was built in 1930. Mm -hmm. And the highway went through in 32. Uh, this was the end of the highway from, uh, from 19, roughly, roughly 28 to 32 when it finally went to the desert. And so um, the area originally was people coming in from the west. Uh, my cabin was built by Chapey Grant, who had the Grant Hotel in San Diego. And this was his getaway at the end of the road. Later, when the highway went down to the desert, the area blossomed to the number of people from the desert that came up here to get out of the heat in the summertime. Mm -hmm. So when I was a kid up here, many of the people down here uh, were from the desert. Uh, Smith's Dates, um, all of the, the different ones had their uh, summer cabins up here. I see. And at that time, it was only the one little subdivision. And then the electricity arrived in 57. And with that, people could drill wells. And it spread out ever since. Um, they're now looking at some drill problems because some of the wells are going dry. Uh, there's been no rain or snow to replenish like it used to be like in the 1940s, uh, late 40s, we could hike all over this place without a canteen. Mm -hmm. Just go from spring to spring or creek to creek. And by 1955, you had to start carrying water because everything was drying up. And mm -hmm. it's been drying up ever since, so. Well, how old were you when you first came up here then? Just about two and a half. So when you moved up here, your grandparents had a, a cabin. Uh, they bought the cabin in December of 41. Mm -hmm. We started up here in June of 41, living in a tent down at the campground. And we'd go back and forth between here and Herky Creek Campground. Mm -hmm. My mother had asthma, and the doctors told her she had to get away from the coast. And so she moved down to a small place in Palm Springs. And my grandfather was still working uh, on the uh, Depression times. He worked three weeks on, two weeks off. So every time we got two weeks off, we would come down here, pick up my mom, come up here onto the mountain, stay the two weeks, and then drop her off on the way back. And I went to live with my grandparents in L.A. So. Yeah. Um, what was the connection between your place up here and the place in Palm Springs? Uh, the only connection was that that was where my mom was staying, uh, from the doctor saying to get away from the coast. They, mm -hmm. I grew up in Lamita, yeah. which was down by the harbor. And, of course, when the war broke out, then my mom moved home and things changed. But since my grandfather took the streetcar to work, he saved his gas coupons. And every time we got time off, he, we would come up here. So what do you mean, his gas coupons? What during the war, you had coupons. You only got so much ration gas. Mm -hmm. And like my dad had to use his coupons to get back and forth to work. But since my grandfather took the streetcar, he didn't have to use any gas coupons. Mm -hmm. So he would keep them until in reserve until we get time off and then we could use his gas coupons to come up here. 
And we had the there cabinet. There was no gas station. How did you have to gas up before you came up? There was a gas station here. Oh, is that right? Yeah, the old store that you came by down there by the fire station. That was a uh, Nightingale uh, old store that mm -hmm. was run by Harry and Cora Bell. Cora was Art's sister. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the, at that time, there was no electricity. Everything up here basically was white gas and kerosene. So that's what every, everything at night you had lamps, lamps, and if you were playing games, you had a, you did a Coleman lamp, so you get more light instead of just plain lamps. Sandy, what's your what's your history up here? How did you know? Tell me about that. Well, I when I was living in Rancho Mirage, I was widowed, mm -hmm. and um, we had been up Highway 74 many times and I admired, admired the area and since I was alone my children all grown up mm -hmm. and gone um, I started coming up and looking around and mm -hmm. pricing lots. What year was that approximately? Oh around between 2000 and 2002 mm -hmm. and um, so there was a real estate lady up here and um, she showed me some places. I didn't see anything in, in that was already here. Mm -hmm. And then I started wandering around and found this lot. I see. It's a full acre. And I thought, this is, this is it. <laughs> this is it. And so I, I had a girlfriend that came up with me sometimes and we started clearing the brush. Did you? Mm-hmm. Did did you, what kind of equipment did you have to clear the brush? Oh my goodness, our hose and rakes oh, and really? wagons. We would fill a wagon up yeah. with, with um, all the stuff that we were clearing out. A wheelbarrow or a wagon? More yeah. of a, well, I think I had both. Mm -hmm. And that's going back quite a ways, <laughs> I don't remember. But uh, that's how I got started. And did it help you? What, what were you? Th were you uh, when you were doing that? Did you envision the kind of house you wanted, or you didn't know then? Well, I I did in a way envision that I wanted to get a manufactured, you know, a manufactured mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. and because I thought it was just too much, even though my deceased husband was a building contractor and I had seen all the things that have to be done. Mm -hmm. I just thought it would be better for me to yeah. have a... Not too co as complicated. Yes. So I went, there's quite a few different companies that have manufactured homes, at least at that time. Mm -hmm. And when I saw this one, I saw, uh, uh, just sitting there, it really talked to me and I, th I was interested and I said, but it doesn't have enough windows. Mm -hmm. And if you can do this for a certain amount of money, I want more windows. I want it to be light, light mm -hmm. and bright. And so that's how I got this lot. And um, they put so much, I asked for many things for this house. And they took one of those big trucks and and brought the house up in pieces. And um, I had lengthened rooms and I'd, I really had done a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally it was finished and I moved in. And that's, I loved it, loved it, loved it. What do you like about it? Tell me what are some of the special areas for you? It just works. Yeah. It Does works. Does it have like, it's, it faces See, I thing. had these put in. Okay. French doors. Yeah, I see why you would. Yeah, and um, around the morning room is over there. Yeah. It's totally round and all windows. Mm-hmm. It's unusual shape. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, um, and in the master bedroom, mm -hmm. uh, I put in extra um, windows mm -hmm. so I could open it up. Okay. Yeah, I love it. women love that. Mm -hmm. They like the light. Um, Harry, are you an archaeologist or a geo 
I, w I have worked as a geologist, archaeologist, paleontologist, and a historian. Okay. So. Um, obviously, this this being up here satisfies those areas. And so, tell me how your occupation connected to the, this <coughs> area up here. Well, basically, um, my occupations were not in this area. I see. But uh, being a geologist, I have gone around and looked at a lot of the geology around here. For instance, you're sitting right now on the what they call the shear zone that comes up Palm Canyon, makes almost a right angle bend, that comes through here, makes another right angle bend, and goes down toward Borrego on the east end. What do you call that now? It's the shear zone. S? S-H-E-A-R. Shear. shear zone, okay. And uh, so I looked at that and then... Um, some of the stuff from my old, when I grew up with the old prospectors here, we used to go out and we went with them on some trips to help them with their claim work and do yeah. different things. Now, what, uh, the, the shear zone, uh, did you follow that as a sort of a trip? It's, it's yeah. a trend that goes through most of Southern California. Mm -hmm. It comes up Palm Canyon, turns through here, goes back down to Borrego, then it's offset by the San Jacinto Fault, and then it goes on down. And it even goes across the San Andreas here and goes over into the mountains to the north. That um, is an old z zone when the state was come putting being put together. Um, and then for archaeology, the area has a lot of grinding ore. Oh, they this, do. This was a major food resource area for the Cahuilla. Mm -hmm. uh, people in the desert came up here in the spring, mm -hmm. gathered foods stayed up here during the summer mm -hmm. and then in the fall gathered foods on the way back down and then wintered down on the desert. Now these are the Kauia and also um, basically Kauia. Settlers, basically Kauia. And this was all Kauia territory. It was. Yeah. And this area is rather interesting because part of this area was desert Kauia and part is considered mountain Kauia. Yeah. So this was sort of a dividing point here. Now, do you, is it still Indian land now? Not here, the reservation, Santa Rosa Reservation is just up the road. Mm -hmm. And then farther over toward Anza is the Ramona Reservation and mm -hmm. the Cahuilla Reservation. So. The Cahuilla have, how, how many uh, different subsets of Cahuilla are there? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the, Standard is three, the mountain, desert, and pass Kauia. I use five, because I have the pass, the mountain, the Coyote Canyon, the San Jacinto Kauia, and the pass Kauia. I had two more groups in, which according to some of the mission records were literally separate. So do they mind that, or is, it, is that okay, or do they? Mm. Well, it, it's by geographic, so it doesn't bother them any because um, they would probably prefer that it would be done by clan and moiety, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the information on clans and moieties is so screwed up that uh, yeah. you know so one publication has somebody as a clan, somebody as a moiety, and there's just no way to do it. There's no elders left to help you. So, who is considered? Does does each um, is it a clan? Does each clan have their own elder? Yeah, well, well, the elders are just the, the people of, that know the history. Yeah. And most of them have passed away. Just lost one down at TM the other day. She was 90-some years old. And so she knew um, quite a bit about the past history. But uh, a lot of it's never been passed down. And so when somebody is gone, so is the information. And what? And how much... What do they have that they'd say? Do they have any kind of... Um well, the history of the tribe and okay. the families. The families have it? The families did have it. Um, what happened? They just... Well, it, just like uh, any other family today, yeah. they lost interest in their, in their past. Yeah. And right now there's a lot of them gaining an interest in their past. Oh, okay. And uh, the problem is it's almost too late. Yeah. I've maintained a lot of the records because I first met them up here out of the Santa Rosa Reservation in the 40s. And they yeah, were so nice. I like to talk about that. They, they were nice enough to take time to talk to a kid. So 
-hmm. you were interested you were an interested kid so they right. how old were you then I was about five you were interested when you were five yeah see this was all cattle country and they rode for Jim Wellman who had the ranch right at the end of the street it was the old 101 ranch and um, Art Wanche, Galito Tortoise, George Tortoise, Castro Chihuahua Tortoise, uh, that group, um, Arnez family, all rode for him. All right, yeah. so um, five years old, five year old kid. Did your father help you? Well, how did you get interest? Did your father interest? Was he? Oh, interested? my grandfather and my father, uh, my grandfather, and then when my brother came home from the war in '45. Uh, like everybody else, you know, they, we're, we don't need you anymore, so here, goodbye. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the soldiers had trouble, but m my brother was lucky because he came up here and the people up here looked after him or helped him. And one of the groups that helped him was Santa Rosa. Uh, he, was, he and my grandfather were one of the few up here that were allowed to go hunt on the reservation. Oh, it was hunting. And, okay. um, and well, back then we lived quite well on on wild game, okay. um, rabbit, quail, mm -hmm. and dove, uh, and then during the season the wild pigeons would come through, and that was not unusual for food up here for everybody that lived up here. Um, so you would have, that was your, your protein, your, mm -hmm. what did you have, like, uh, cow or anything? No, the cattle were here, but we didn't bother any cattle. I see. But didn't need to? It was all open range, so the cows had the, the right of way. Mm -hmm. If you wanted cows out of your yard, you fenced them out, nobody had to fence them in. Oh, and in the morning, you'd get up quite frequently there at the cabin, there'd be a cow looking in the window at you, mm -hmm. making their way through. And that's how we got involved. We had an old kerosene refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So we had ice, and not everybody up here had ice. And when they were running cattle over here and come by, if we were the, up here, they would come by the house and we always had iced tea or homemade root beer. And so they would stop at the house and have something to drink on the way back to the ranch over here. And that's how I got to, to meet the, the group, the, the cattlemen that came through. And now the cattlemen, uh, what, the cattlemen, were they uh, Native American or they were? A, or good, a good deal of them were, yeah. They were? Yeah. They, from the Santa Rosa Reservation over here, the uh, Cahuilla Reservation worked for a lot of the ranches over on I the see. other side of the hill. But this side was uh, mainly the people from the Santa Rosa Reservation. So that's how I got to meet them. And then later, uh, my grandfather and my brother would go over there hunting with them and they would come by and um, they became very close friends of the family. So it was a, a nice knit group. Mm -hmm. um, how many people would you say were in that group? In that group? Well, we only had maybe, at the most up here, in, in that group, maybe eight or ten, and at the whole subdivision was maybe 25 or 30 at that time. So, much different than these, what it is these today. These are um, settlers, and mm -hmm. also, these no, are... These they're are not really settlers, they're just... These are colonists, or I don't know what yeah. you call them. Uh, they were just... People that were up here, the, the cattle ranching was oh, was okay. a major item. Now, did the uh, did the Amer Native Americans have ranches themselves, or they worked for the ranch? They ran some cattle, and then there used to be the big corral back here at Asbestos Mountain. Mm -hmm. And when they'd have the big roundup, they would bring them into that big corral. And then there was a small corral with a loading chute, and everybody'd sep separate their cows out, and then they would run them up into the little corral, and then up in a truck, and then take them back to their place. So it was a time when everybody looked after each other. Yeah. Uh, you did. What year was that then? That's the 40s, 40s into the 50s. When did that start tapering off? Uh, after the electricity got here. Really? Then, because this area was always short of water. Mm -hmm. So development was hindered because of the water shortage. And then when the electricity got here, people could drill their own wells. I see. And so with the water being available, everybody bought a lot, like Sandy's on, on a well. Mm -hmm. In my house over there is not, it's on the water district. Our water comes from up on Santa Rosa, from a spring up there. 
So what is the what is the quality of your water compared to the quality of the water in We have a lot less calcium in our water than there is over here. Does it taste different? Mm, not really. Mm -hmm. But if you notice over here, a lot of stuff over here has a white coating on it. That's from the calcium. That's the calcium. And you can see up the road here where it is, those the big white areas, the old dolomite mines, yeah. which is calcium, magnesium, carbonate. And, uh, you know, the, the mines up here were dependent on Palm Desert. During the 50s when Palm Desert was in a big building boom and everybody wanted oh, flat roofs with the white rock oh on yeah. it. So the, so the roofs that they were built, they were that they were using for the homes in Palm Desert were made of dolomite. Yeah, they were white dolomite. And it came from up here, the two big dolomite mines, one over here and one behind the store. And the trouble with dolomite is that it's a very low value commodity. So if you only have to haul it from here to the bottom of the hill, you can make money mining it. If you have to mine it here and take it to LA, it's no good because it costs you more to transport it than it's worth. So as soon as the building boom went bust down in Palm Desert, all the mines shut down up here. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. so, so there was a building boom. In Palm Desert. In Palm Desert. And what year are you talking? In the 50s. In the 50s. Where were you then? Where were you? Scattered around. Yeah, but you did. Well, did I graduated high school in 57, but so I was up here on a, a lot of occasions. Mm -hmm. so did you know you were going to retire up here? Did you know that from the get-go? Mm, not really. Mm -hmm. um, I had rocks in my head, so I studied and became a geologist. Mm -hmm. And then when I finished school, my first jobs were in a lot, were actually one in Nevada for one year. And then I spent nine summers in the Arctic of Alaska and then part of one winter up there on drill rig. So well, the one winter with what? On a drill rig. Oh, is that right? Yeah, 46 below. So, but I, I love Alaska and I also lived with natives up there. I'm still in contact with um, some of the people at Arctic Village where we stayed when we were working up there. Where um, is that near Arctic Village? Arctic Village is in the Yukon Candy Plain. Uh, closest thing would be Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you were up in Alaska? 75. So, How I would, would you like to see it again. <laughs> he loved it. Absolutely loved it. But yeah, it was it was a big part of my life. I yeah. was a, what I did was you, in what way? What did you take away from that? What was what was it? Well, the people up there were sort of like the people were down here when I was growing up as a kid. Things were not so fast paced uh, yeah. like the, everything is today. They weren't trying to everybody outdo somebody else. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a case of if you didn't do it. Uh, it wasn't going to get done, yeah. And uh, you weren't doing it because you wanted to get paid. You just did it because yeah. you needed to. And it was still that way when I was up. I'm sure Alaska is not that way anymore now either. But uh, it was when when I was up there. What years were that then? I was first was '66 through '75. So. But How did you get up there? I was, I was working as a petroleum geologist. Did you, I mean, did you fly up or did you drive Yeah, we up? flew up and we lived every day in a tent camp and mm -hmm. uh, went by helicopter everywhere. So we would leave in the morning, fly out, work on the geology and fly back to camp. What would you do, for example, what would your day look like uh, as a geologist up there? That was it. You got up, had breakfast. And what did you do? Pa like? Packed the lunch. You would go and... You have a particular area that you were yeah, investigating? We, whatever we were working on the stratigraphy of the area, we'd fly over to the Shublik, Sadarochitz, it's Canning River, all these different areas, and uh, collect and look at uh, what the rocks were, looking for what was a reservoir rock and what was a potential source rocks, and doing all of the material up there. So I spent 20 years as a petroleum geologist. That was my beginning, and then when the bust went in there and I didn't have, I could see that I wasn't going to have a job, I was able to get a job out here. We were living in Colorado at that time. 
And so uh, what end is that? Some you mentioned the bus. Uh, the oil oh, company. The bus. Okay. Yeah, the oil company sold out. I see. Yeah, I worked for Texaco. Texaco sold out to Chevron. I was working for Tenneco in Denver, and they sold out. And when they sell out, um, the new companies want their people in, not the old people. Yeah. So Did they give you any warning, or they just showed up one day and said? Uh, well, I knew that knew they were selling, so I yeah. started looking before that the sale went through. But um, I had a chance to come back out here, and I went to work out here as an environmental geologist. So what I were your what were yours? Uh, mainly pulling gas tanks. Oh yeah. And that was the time when steel tanks had to be removed, and everything had to be fiberglass, and a lot of the old tanks had leaked. Yeah. So when we pull the tanks, we'd have contaminated soils, and we were, had to go in and do the cleanups and get everything done. And I did that for six years, and then uh, the tank deal was pretty well done, and they d didn't need any more people. Oh. So then I went to work as a soils geologist. And uh, up here? No, uh, this was down in, uh, on the. San Bernardino area okay. and down that way, uh, and uh, but we lived up here, and then went down there and went to a soils geologist for materials for seven years, and during that time I'd gone back to school and gotten a degree in archaeology at night school, and so uh, I had a chance to go to work with another company um, doing geology, archaeology, and paleontology because my schooling was in paleontology and then I found out I knew all this area so I started working mm -hmm. as a historian since we were working this area and I did that until just a few years ago I finally retired but uh, and that also put me in with the Native Americans because we did a lot of excavations of sites down here and we had a group of Native American excavators and then also uh, if we had any cremations or burials we had to have somebody come out and bless them and tell us what they wanted done with them. And so I got to meet a lot of the um, people, the mm -hmm. tool that came out to the sites. Do they cremate the Native Americans? The, the Kauia were mainly cremations. Do they cremate one at a time or do they cremate, uh, you know, several? Uh, yes and no. Uh, if, like when the smallpox epidemic hit, um, the, they became sort of multiple cremations. If a family died, they would just leave them inside the house and burn the house down. Were you ar around for anything like that? No, I was. Okay. Uh, that was eight, 1862, oh. <laughs> that I'm was, sorry. That was when killed uh, thousands of Southern California Indians. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, do they still have a cremation process? Uh, only once in a while. Okay. Uh, most of it's burial now. I've been lucky, or whatever you want to call it, to attend two actual cremations mm -hmm. that were done. Do you mind describing what that's like? Oh, well, I have written one of them up on Biff. Okay. Um, the one that I, the one down here. I don't. No, I don't think I want to talk about okay. it. Okay. No. Um. But that's a pri very private. You're saying. Yeah, it's, it's not a, really open to the public. Okay. We so were both invited. Yep. So, yeah, Diana Chihuahua was. It's a privilege to uh, be invited, I believe. Yeah, we we spent the time at Diana Chihuahua's cremation, and then also at uh, Biff, mm -hmm. who was um, Andrea's family. Two elders that we lost. Mm -hmm. so. Um. Before you mentioned to me, uh, I'm trying to make the connection between here and Happy Point. Point Happy? Point Happy, yeah. Happy Point Happy, is this, you mentioned it again by this. Uh, well, this Point Happy was a large village. Okay. Cavendish. And uh, probably that village was wiped out by that smallpox epidemic. Okay, okay. And one of the big trails that came from down there went up on the other side of Deep Canyon into what's called Little Pinion. And then mm -hmm. there's a main trail from Little Pinion over here. And so this was all connected I see. with the, the different groups that uh, came but when up you here. But if you went from here to Point Happy, 
you'd still have to go down Highway 74 and then go over. You would, oh, no. you would today, but they didn't. Oh, that's what I was Their thinking. Their trails went across from here almost due east to Little Pinion. I see. And then went down from Little Pinion down the canyon there to what's now La Quinta. I see. So, and the same here, there's a big trail that, that came up uh, Carrizo Creek from the mm -hmm. Palm Desert area. And then another big trail, series of trails actually, that came up Palm Canyon. Um, I wanted to, to have just written down um, Desert Center. Okay, exactly how do you describe the location of Desert Center? Well, Desert Center was built by uh, Desert Steve Ragsdale. Yeah, right. And okay. he had the cabin up here. It was so still there? He w yeah, it's still there. So he was a good friend of the family's. He also had the cabin up on Santa Rosa, and, and so... We had access to stay up at the cabin. That was one of the places when bro brother came home from the war. He stayed up at Steve's old log cabin up on the mountain. Steve Ragsdale? Yeah. He and was, he was uh, a hermit that he wasn't was a, a hermit. hermit. But he, people came to the pa pa house, though? Or? No, no. But what, he was strictly anti-alcohol? and. Oh, yeah. Well, tell me more about that. Uh, he, he, he was a... He was a no drinking at all type of person. Yeah. And if you had been drinking, you didn't go to his place because he could smell it. And he lived up here with his secretary, Terry Lowe. Um, he had little to do with uh, Desert Center. Desert Center was run by his wife and the kids. Were they separated out? Or? Um, yeah, it was, oh, a, stra it was a strange deal. <laughs> and the only one of his sons that I really knew was Stanley. And Stanley would come up, knew him fairly well. But uh, it was really funny because Steve and Terry Lowe came down and said, well, we're going up to the mountain to the cabin. Do you want to go with us? And we said, sure. So Steve had this touring car, and he had no back seats because he carried the goats in the back seat. He couldn't drink cow's milk. He could only drink goat's milk, so he had his own goats. Where were the goats? And They, they stayed in the shed, the goat shed here, and then the goat shed that was okay. up there. Well, it took almost three hours to find the seats and get the goat material cleaned out so the seats would go in. Uh, he could carry one goat and two bales of hay or two goats and one bale of hay. So it depended on how long he was going to be gone. And a lot of times if they were going up to the mountain and we were up here and we took care of the goats while, uh, while he was gone. So we learned to drink a lot of goat's milk and my mom learned to make very good goat cheese. Ooh. And people up here that wouldn't drink goat's milk loved the cheese. Oh, that sounds good. So we had lots of cheese. But it was an interesting deal with that. Um, you know, the cabin had no pipe water. It was just on top of the hill. This is so where uh, Mr. Ra Ragsdale lived. Yeah. He lived. He lives on in Indio Avenue, same street as this, only oh. over there. His, okay. his house. Is Who lives in there now? I have no idea. Okay. Okay. Um, um, Maybe. What was the connection between them and the cafe and market? Was there some kind of was it? You mean in Desert Center? Yeah. Yeah, that was. See, he bought Desert Center, but Desert Center wasn't on the highway there. It was on the road going out to the uh, to the north. Mm -hmm. Can't think of the name of it right now, or the number of it right now. And he realized that all the traffic was on the highway going east west, so he picked oh. the whole town up and <laughs> moved it down to put it, and then it was uh, 60, 70, uh, 99 on the, on the old route. Now it's I-10. But in the city is still on the old route, not on the freeway. Mm -hmm. And that was um, about halfway between the, this end, the desert area, and the other end of the Colorado River. Mm -hmm. Desert Steve used to say he had desert the longest Steve. front road in, in, in any city 50 miles this way and 50 miles that way. <laughs> so. is, does that uh, structure still exist? Mm -hmm. And it's now the? It's still the town of Desert Center. What, give me an example of a. Uh, there's not much there anymore. The oh, old cafe is, is gone. Is there a store or anything? Yeah, you know, it was a major stop because it was so far to anything on either end. But now with I-10, I uh, people don't slow down going from one place to the other. So that was a 
an interesting time back then. You know, see, he wanted to be buried there, and he had his grave dug down there and had everything all set to be buried in the county, wouldn't let him be buried there. And Steve also had a very close connection with the reservation because it was three of the people from the reservation that dug his grave down there. And then all of a sudden they, the, the county stood up and the said The county no. said no, he, so he ended up being buried in cemetery. But the old grave and the market, my grandfather spent his time down there, he w had star chisels and he drove the holes in the rock to hang the big plaque that's down there for the, for the burial. Is it there but now? It, yeah, it's still there. Is that a picture of it? Yeah, we have pictures of the end of the grave. Uh, Steve always had his old pipe. Now Steve was the father? He, 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 was, he, he was the founder and he, yes, his family, the Ragsdale family. I As see. I say, he lived up here most of the time. And but was he the hermit? Or was he no, it was the, the hermit over here was Acorn Bill. But, oh. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, he, he lived up here even though he was the founder of Desert Center and Desert Center was basically run by his wife and boys. Okay. Family. Was this considered up here a, a tr some kind of a trade route? During, during the Native Americans, yes. Yeah. Shell, you, had, you had a shell trade from the coast to the southwest. Uh, part of that came through here. The, the big trade here was in food resources. Of, uh, agriculture? Not agriculture. Food, well, like well, what? Uh, the Kuya were not agricultural until much later. Uh, up here you had the acorns, you had the pinion nuts, you had the wild apricots or wild plums, depending on who you talk to. You had the yucca. You had all of these resources, food resources, that you didn't have other places. And one of the big ones was agave. Mm -hmm. um, agave was harvested up here, roasted and taken, and it was actually a trade item to some of the people, the tribes that didn't have agave. The same with pinion nuts and all of these things. So they were a trade item. Down in the desert, the main food item was mesquite. And there was lots of it. Um, that was the major food item for the uh, people down there to get a difference. That's why they actually came up here in the summertime to add to their food resources that they had down here. And down there, rabbits were a big one and people don't realize it, but the antelope used to be a big one. The area down there used to have quite a bit of antelope until the people shot them all off. It used to be a big thing to come out on the train from Los Angeles and shoot antelope. And now there aren't any antelope. So they were successful. If you say that there were traders, did they have a trading post, or how did they do no, their no, trading? No, just, no, just from person people to would just show up or? person to person. I see. You would, um, maybe somebody would go from here to the village over in Anza, and somebody else would come up from the village in Temecula and brought with them something, some shell beads or whatever, and so they would trade for material there. Then that person would come over with the shell beads and see something they wanted, so they'd trade the shell beads, and then the I shell see. beads would be traded, and they ended up, um, you know, the Southwest, a lot of the shell beads are either from Gulf of, Mex Gulf of California or from Southern California. When I was excavating for the outfits in, in Den out of Denver, Colorado, we actually found shell beads that were traded from clear out here. So. Did you do excavating? In uh, Palm Desert area? Mm -hmm. Oh, you did? Did you do excavating in Indian Wells? We did the one in the excavation in Indian Wells. Uh, we did some out in Palm Desert. We worked with the company I was working for. We excavated all over the Coachella Valley. As what well was as the purpose uh, of the excavation? Development. So when they were, g the developers were going to make, do something, they had you come out and excavate. Well, they had, had we had to be there when they started grading, and if the grading found anything, yeah. then we had to shut down the grading and um, take care of the material that they had run into. Well, what kind of material? Um, well, cremations, I see. Uh, cooking in items, grinding items, whatever they, we ran into. Any relics? Relics that we would have to then clear before they could continue on grading. 
So a lot of times what we'd have to do is shut down grading in one area and monitor over here. And if they didn't hit anything, they could keep grading until we got this taken care of. Then they could come back and grade there. Who determined uh, whether or not you could move forward if something was... Um, yeah. Whoever came out from the tribe. Oh, they so you would call the tribe and they would come out? They had to come out and take care of it and go over everything. That's where another thing where I met a lot of the, of the native people because they were coming out to the site. So. Like what was the most unusual thing you ever saw at an excavation? Well, to me, I, none of it's unusual. Like what things, just what but, are some uh, of the things like? Uh, arrowheads? Or? Well, we've, we've covered a lot of arrowheads, sh shaft straighteners, pipes, grinding implements, matatis, mono, pestles. Uh, see, down in the desert, they use wooden mo uh, mortars. So they use stone pestles in a wooden mortar. Well, the mortar doesn't keep. It's gone, but the pestles are still in. Mm -hmm. Up here, they use the stone. And so the mortar holes are here, and the pestles are gone because everybody's picked them up. So if you can go, you can go out here several places and see the grinding holes where they used to grind their uh, acorns and other materials. So At the Hamilton Museum, or we have some over there, but I'm just out across the flats here. There's a whole lot of them. So, as I say, this was a major food resource area. There, are, the Kauia were also uh, weavers, right? Well, they were basket makers. Right? Basket makers. Very good basket makers. Are they still? few of them. There's a group that try to keep it alive. Um, Roseanne uh, over at the Kauia Reservation still does basketry. Um, I think Lori Sirskoff still does some. And I don't know, I can't remember a name over at Santa Rosa that was a basket maker. But, uh, and I don't know whether she still does basketry or not. They usually get together at least once a year uh, to do basketry up at Idlewild. I've seen that. So, yeah. um, what is the connection between here and Idlewild? It's just, it, I mean, it I was, know. It was still Mountain Kauia territory. Oh. The, there's the trails went from here over there, and then later that was cattle country, and uh, they got heavy snow over there. So basically this became winter area for cattle. The Garner Valley would get five, six feet of snow, and so there was no place to keep the cattle. So in the summer, the cattle were over there, and in the winter, they were over here. And then later, um, during the war, Jim had that contract with the government to supply beef, and this became full-time uh, area over here. Right at the very end of this road is the old, what's left of the old 101 ranch. So that was where Jim had the ranch when I was a kid. Did you go visit? Hmm? Did you go over there? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody's built a house and done everything, and all of the old stuff is gone. I think there's still part of the foundation from the old barns maybe over there, and that's about I, it. Yeah. So. Um, I have this quote from you. The mountains were a great obstacle to travelers. This was one place you could go through the mountains with a wagon. So, wait a minute, that doesn't... So what, when, when the people would take vehicles um, across here, they could come up from where? Let's say we're coming from San Diego. How would they? Well, the, old, the first road in here was for the asbestos mining. Okay. Oh, I see. And uh, see, the asbestos mines were in operation before there was a road in here. Uh, they used to take it out on um, horseback, bag it and haul it out, and then... That was the only real commercial item up here until the dolomite was asbestos. Were you here when they, they had the oh asbestos? Yeah. yeah. Was it, uh, how far away? It's right back over here, but um, since asbestos is hazardous, they buried right. it. They buried it. Mm -hmm. So w when you uh, found out that there, you know, asbestos, how did that go where they, they were just using all this asbestos and one day it was like, Let's get rid of it. How did that happen? The environmentalist, it was declared a, a cancer causer. How long did that take for it to be discovered? Quote well, the mine had pretty well shut down before oh, asbestos was uh, considered a hazard. Do you believe that it is a hazard? Yeah, but then so is everything else. I know. So 
You know, you, 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 pick, that, you pick out one at a time and, and get rid of it. Did you think it was overblown? Uh, yeah, if it's handled right. You know, asbestos was used a lot in plaster that people don't realize because the plaster goes on much better and easier when it has asbestos uh -huh. in it. And that was one of the main uses. And see, they wanted the short fiber asbestos. And uh, they let me go in the mine. I used to go in and get the long fiber because they didn't care. Okay, so wait a second. Where did the, uh, t what was the location of the short fiber versus the location of the long it fiber? It was in the same, same t uh, added. Was it, what was more advantageous? I mean, they needed Well, they, they took whatever, but they were interested in the short fiber when they were, because they were crushing it out there. I see. And so I would go in and get the long fiber when I was going to school. And there was an outfit there in Long Beach. I used to sell it for my textbook. Um, what they, did they use that for? Long I time. have no idea. They probably they just dealt in minerals and stuff. So I'm okay. sure that they just wanted. It. That's why they wanted the long fiber. Does and it look like uh, like just fiber? Or? Yeah, it it, it, it frays right off, just like. Oh, is fibers. that right? Like string? Maybe? Yeah, it's you know. So it it's an interesting material. That it, I get a kick out of. I don't know what ever happened to Charlie Boy, but it, Charlie Boy had the mine over there. Still? He, well, it's buried now. Oh, okay. The Forest Service. Uh, because Were you it's, here? Because, when, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, it's National Monument, and they can't have anything that hazardous, so they actually buried the whole thing. But uh, we used to go there, Charlie Boy, they had the old jaw crusher going, and it looked like a big snowstorm of all the dust from crushing it. So, you know, I'm sure that if anybody died of cancer from um, asbestos, Charlie Boy did. Yeah. So. Well, these people was right there in the manufacturing, you know, in the excavation. Oh, yeah. And then. Uh, when the crusher was going, that was the worst. They had like powder flying yeah, all over the Yeah, powder was flying everywhere. I mean, you could, you could see it when you drove up. So. But you didn't think, did people, people didn't think much of it. I mean, mm -hmm. what. No. What did they never even thought about it? Did no, they nobody paid much. They, they might wear a hemp bandana over their it, mouth, yeah, or just over their face because it was hard to breathe and you had yeah. all that dust flying. But we, nobody paid much attention to it. How long did that go on? Uh, that? It was still there in the fifties. It was before they declared it um, a hazard, and I can't tell you exactly when that was. That's okay. Uh, so. Did you feel that, you know, since you had been in there, did you feel that you had any exposure to any of that? Well, I've had exposure to it, but I don't, I don't worry about it. I have exposure to a lot of things. Yeah, I know. When I was working as an environmental geologist, I was exposed to a lot of different stuff. Chemicals, you know, when you were having to clean up sites, so. Did you feel that, oh, well, I'm. I don't worry about it. It's, a, in, it's not we, we invented, a, but it was. We have a knee-jerk reaction. Yes, we do. You know, uh, especially the, the the group we have in there now, uh, I call it the the cart before the horse because they move before they think about anything. I know it. Uh, you know, it, yes, there's glo there's I global warming and global warming's bad, but you don't destroy the whole country because of global warming. You actually sit down, and figure out what can we do, yeah. and then do something instead of jumping and then figuring yeah. out. Well, oh, we just we just did it wrong. Yeah. So well, when people ha when there's money involved, people yeah, jump. The at only it. two things in the world today are money and power. And I'm, I'm lucky because my family never had either one. Yeah, so that, that is so true. Yeah, so. But it's a, uh, it's not a blessing. It's not a blessing. Did they have gladiolus up here? What kind of? Uh, no, what? we had gladiolus, but only gladiolus were planted. They're, they're well, not do they many. have any uh, agricultural crops up here? No. No. Other than Wilson Howell. Wilson Howell had a big garden. Uh, lots they of still have that? No, it's been wiped out by the development up there now, Springcrest. He had a really nice garden with good fruit trees. and uh, uh, he, he was a, a, what do you, an agriculturalist. Everything was no commercial fertilizer. Everything was done with organics. Organics. Uh, he had the big worm bin up there. You know, we, he raised earthworms, oh. uh, compost. We had several compost bins. 
because we used to go up and help him because he he gave us all kinds of vegetables mm. and fruit and everything. So, what about um, hot springs? Is there hot springs? None around here. Just down in the canyon, Palm Canyon. There's the hot springs, and then the one down where everybody knows down at the bottom of the hill. There is a hot springs over on the Kauia Reservation, mm -hmm. and there's a hot springs on the Saboba Reservation. Santa Rosa has a sulfur spring, but it's not a hot spring. Mm -hmm. uh, see, that was one of the deals about, about the Kauia was the, the medicine men that were the, could go into the hot springs down here and then come up in the hot springs at another location. And they could travel around that way. Um, then you had the bear shaman who could turn themselves into a bear, run t faster that way to get someplace, and then turn themselves back into a person before they got to the, the other end. Um, there's a, a lot of very interesting deals, but it was interesting that so many of the reservations have hot springs. Uh, Saboba has hot springs. Are they sort of centered around the hot springs? Or yeah, they, they were, well, see, water was a big thing. If you didn't have a good water supply, you couldn't have a village. Yeah. So villages were pretty well located by water supply. Um, collecting areas, things of this sort, you could carry water. Like up here, there's a lot of campsites out here. There are no springs, but there used to be big springs down here when I was a kid. Where are they dried up now? Oh yeah, they're, almost all the springs are gone now. But what they could do is, for, the, for that type of thing, they could go to the spring and carry water back to their camp because those mm -hmm. were usually just probably family camps. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's so many, is one family was working here, one family over here, uh, gathering the same items and processing it. But, uh, that, but for a village, no. A village had to have some kind of a permanent water supply. Have any of those water supplies completely dried up? Or oh yeah, most of them are gone now. So that doesn't really uh, identify the different areas of Well, that. you went by the old store down here coming up, mm -hmm. and that was uh, the old store when I was a kid. Their water came from a spring over behind the fire station. And they had an old tr truck with it was either two or three 55 gallon drums on the back of it. And they would pull the truck over there, run the hose down, fill the barrels. And then when the barrels at the store got low on water, somebody go drive the truck over, put the water in the barrels and then drive the truck back and put the hose back in and fill it. Uh, Cause the only water came from Amstot. And What's no, Amstot? Amstot Creek over here. Oh, okay. And Amstot Creek water came, that was our village water. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that Art Nightingale got the okay for that was he had to supply water to the campground. Mm -hmm. Well, there was no pipe from here to the store, so they didn't have pipe water. After the war, 45, Art bought all that uh, copper pipe from the government surplus up at Point Wainimi mm -hmm. and came down and replaced this spring with the one up on the, by Timberline. And when he did that, that pipe came right by the store. So then the store had its first pipe of water oh. in, in uh, 45 or 46. And that was really a good thing on his part because shortly thereafter, the Onstott Spring went dry. How so long does it take for something to go dry like that? Uh, Several years or no, six it months? It just starts to, starts to go and then it, uh, yeah. within a year it's gone. So... It, it's been pretty interesting up here, to, as I say. When, we were, when I was a youngster, we didn't ha have to carry water. Do they have any body of water up here that's thriving? Or it's mm -hmm. all pretty much on the it was, it was all springs and creeks. Yeah. yeah. There was no lakes up here other than Did that. Did that help when they had that water? Was it uh, helpful in the fire situation up here? or did We didn't have much in the way of fire situations. We didn't have any fire trucks. The closest fire engine was over in Kenworthy, mm -hmm. over there. And so when one of the houses over here that one time caught fire, by the time the engine got over from Kenworthy, the house was gone. So things are a lot different today with the number of fire engine, 
fire department engines that they had. How many fire departments do they have around? Well, I was on the volunteer fire department for a long time till the county stopped it. But we had the engine here. We had the one in Anza, the one over in Garner Valley, the one down in Palm Desert. And it's, a, and the one in, it's really an interesting way that everything is done. It's done with a cover engine. If our engine had to go for an accident or something in this direction, mm -hmm. 33 came up from Palm Desert and filled in here. They still have one. Yeah, and then yeah, that's still the way they have it. And then the other one was the, it had to go the other way. Then 57 came over from Anza, and so each engine was moved up. And this accident up here the other day, where the young lady was killed, I was real surprised because they had three engines, an ambulance, a squad, and two CHPs at that site. Did uh, you think that was, what did you think of that, too many? Or? No, I, you're never too many, but okay. it, it's just that there were that many available oh, at I one see. time that they could they could get there and not have to, a lot of times, you know, you have to be careful on what equipment you can send out. And the only nice thing was I see. if they had a, sh a, a, a real emergency and the things were over there that one of the engines could have left and gone I to see. it. But, uh, so they all, whoever's available and if something else comes around, right. they depart, okay. Well, how do you find out, let's say that something happened, how would you know uh, that there would be an accident over here? Would you? You don't, I just happen to be coming home from Anza when it, oh. in the middle <laughs> of the accident. When I left Anza, the, the engine rolled out over there while I was there, and the ambulance rolled out, and I didn't know what they rolled out for, and then when I was coming back over here, I found out because they were all parked right up here. <laughs> so I noticed some, you know, driving up the hill, and plus some uh, closer to here, some some fire areas. Burn fire areas? Burn areas, yeah. 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 So what? The, the last one was 21, the one down here that you came through. Yeah. That was... Uh, I'm still not sure about that one, but. What do you mean? Well, what started it? They sort of move on to the, yeah. Yeah, it, it sort of looked to me like it started more than, in more than one place, and that's not usual. Uh, supposedly, it started with that trailer over there. So I'm not, I'm not sure, but it happened to be in a time when we had a ferocious wind. Yeah. And so it spread very quickly. And I'm fed up with what they do is they should have enough aircraft and big enough That's to true. do something. They have those two little ones at Ryan that come out, and they're the first attack aircraft. And they, they're not big enough. They don't hold enough. Uh, if you're going to attack it, you've got to come out with something that's big, and they don't do it. Uh, I've sent many letters in, and I get nothing back. But You don't get a response at all? No. But... Yeah. Uh, you know, World War II, we won by saturation bombing of Germany, not sending one bomber over every 20 yeah. minutes like we do fighting fires. You know, we send a bomber in, they hit it, and then 20 minutes later, another one comes in. And by then, the fire's already back up and going. Uh, if they're going to really put the fire out, they need a series of bombers that can come in one right after the other, just like we bombed Germany. Would and you consider pinion... I don't know if it's to call it pinion or pinion flats or pinion, just, can I just call it pinion? Well, pinion flats is the whole area. Okay. And then pinion pines was a subdivision here, pinion crest back here. Um, e each of the subdivisions has its own name, but the flat is the, the whole area. Is, the, is this area, is that, does it have that checkerboard? You mean the, on the, the land? Oh yeah. It does? Yeah. Because when the railroad came through, they got every other section for 10 miles on each side of the right away. And so they got their land first. That's why if you look at the Indian reservations, they're checkerboarded. Uh, except for Cahuilla, which is, happens to be more than 10 miles away. Uh, Santa Rosa was checkerboarded because that 10 miles goes clear to the other side of Santa Rosa. Yeah. So the checkerboard pattern is in here. And so basically the railroad got this land and then they sold it to uh, get the money to build the railroad. And that's why um, you see today all the checkerboard that you lands down here. The private land back then was just railroad land and the railroad sold it. This was a railroad section Art Nightingale bought 
political opinion. Oh. Well, where was the railroad then? But it was the one down on the desert. Oh, is that right? They got ten miles on each side of the right of them. That was the well, way. You don't realize the distances, I think. No, they don't. People don't think about it, but ten miles is a long way. So. Did you ever take the train uh, from uh, where you lived out into the desert? No. Mm -hmm. We were. I got to ride it uh, uh, once because uh, Mr. Detweiler used to come up here, and he was the foreman at the Roundhouse in Indio. And uh, what's so the Roundhouse? Where they used to do the engines. Oh, okay, okay. Pro process the engines and worked on them. So he was a foreman, and he had a. Uh, they would run a place and come up here, and when his kids were here, it was nice because then I had kids to play with, because most of the time I was it mm. up here, and um, we got to be good friends. So we would when we go to Indio shopping, we'd end up at their house, and there they were in in, in railroad housing, which was right by the track, mm. and it was really something. You go for there for lunch, and you're sitting at the table, and all of a sudden everything's mm -hmm, bouncing mm -hmm. off the table, and they didn't even. Lynch, they you know they were so used to it that it was a, always a, a major problem here. And then while we were there one time, they were moving one of the engines, and he got me on the engine so I could ride over when they were taking it to the roundhouse. So, but that's the only time I was on the, any of the engines down here. Does the roundhouse still exist? No. Once they went to diesel, they didn't need it. The roundhouse was for the old steam locomotives. Mm -hmm. I hate to ask this question, but is it round? Mm, the one down here, no. Why do they call it a round? Well, most of them were. Oh. They had they had a turntable. Oh. And they would pull the train in, and then they'd turn it, and then the train would go off here to be returned to be worked on, and then they would turn it for that. So they had a whole series of areas like this. So it was it made a round building with that oh, with the I turntable. See. The one down here had a turntable, but it wasn't really a roundhouse. Uh, they had like three or four places that they worked on engines. Did you ever live in Palm Desert? No. Okay. Did you, um, I see you were the president of the Historic Society of... For a while, yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What happened during your, um, when you were the president? Was there any event happening then? Or? No, nothing that really stands out that I can remember. Uh -huh. I mean, we were... We were more into history at that time. Today, they're more into architecture. Oh, interesting that and, you know that, uh, yeah. So that yeah. one of the reasons I'm, I don't go down there much anymore is that my, is history, Native Americans and all of that, not yeah. architecture. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't ha have that close of ties anymore. Um, that fire truck, is that, one of the ones that you were familiar with, the fire truck that they had there? No, that's, uh, I think that's the second engine. I don't think okay. they ever found the first engine that was out of there uh, down there. That that was, back then, that was just for Palm Desert. So. Um, you mentioned that you, uh, there's, there's different um, families within the Korea and I have Morongo, Ramona, Santa Rosa, and Torres Martinez. Is that true? Mm, for the Korea reservations? Korea family members, that's all. Well, fa yeah. family members were um, from all different reservations. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I mean, they really moved around. They visit yeah. each other a lot, right? Well, they actually moved around to get away from stuff. Like what? Well, when Juan Antonio took his mountain, Korea, to Riverside to work for the Lugo Ranch. He left everything wide open. There was nobody living there. So like the Wanche family came from the desert and moved into Mount Kauia territory. The Torte family came from Coyote Canyon. They moved into the area that he had abandoned. So that set up a new thing and it was to get away from smallpox, get away from different things that happened. So these people moved around uh, on it and it's that's one of the problems, and they also change names on them. When I'm trying to do family histories, uh, Art Wanche's uncle moved to Torres Martinez and changed the family name to Duro. So all the Duros down there are relatives of the Wanches over here. 
and uh, Andreas uh, was actually a different name. They were from Sebulba, and when they moved over to Palm Springs, they, they, that was his first name, Andreas, mm -hmm. and he took that as their family name. Mm -hmm. And so a, a lot of different things changed, and the families are from all different reservations. People. That's why I I do it by geographic, not by family, because mm -hmm. they're all you. You can't go to a reservation and basically find somebody that's not related to somebody on another reservation. So has the um, reservation up here has what is the popula Has it changed? It. I don't know what the population is over there. When I was a kid, the Santa Rosa probably had. 10 or 12 people on it. It was all it was living in. What about the Kahuya? Uh, I don't, the Kahuya reservation wasn't that high either because there wasn't anything up here to do for a living. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the people maintained their, t their status on the reservation but actually lived somewhere else so they had a job. And the ones that stayed up here were mostly in the cattle industry. Mm -hmm. Because they, they made their living uh, running cattle up here. What and do they do for a living now? Uh, they have the pit stop over here now. Okay. And um, and I'm not sure on some of the other stuff that you know, each of the reservations has its own. They either have a casino mm -hmm. or they have something uh, like the pit stop or some some material money money making deal for the tribe. So I've heard that, uh, t is this true, that uh, if you're on one of the tribes, and say, let's, if you don't want to talk about this, it's okay, uh, that if some people make the money and other people don't, is, you know? You well, know. you have to be enrolled. You have to be an enrolled member enrolled of that tribe. Enrolled in the tribe. tribe. And if you're enrolled in the tribe, then you get a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. But if you're not enrolled, mm -hmm. uh, you're not really a part of it. That means percent. you have to be a part, you have to be at least, what, 60% Kahuya or something? Uh, it varies from different places. I don't know what they use here um, on it. And like, you know, like the one that was claiming she was Gabrielino, one of the last of the Gabrielinos, they finally did a DNA test and she's not even Native American. So uh, a lot of it. I don't know that story. That sounds like a good story. Yeah, that, well, that just happened not too long ago. It did? Yeah. But, uh, Where was she? Up, up, up here? Well, she lived in Los Angeles area. The Gabrielinos had L.A. Basin. So they, what's the purpose? Of, she wanted the purpose of her claiming that is she wanted some benefit? I, I don't know the purpose. All I know <laughs> is that she, you know, she had been claiming to be the last of them. And oh, uh, the DNA said no, that she probably wasn't even Native American. So, okay. so I don't know. And then I've never heard anything more about it. And just, that That's just an interesting Sort story. of just disappeared. But you know, when you hear about, like, uh, you hear, you know, Na Native American names, and then you hear some um, Mexican names, like Martinez and Martinez. I, you know, I, did they have a Mexican? Uh, Ma Their Native names American? were changed by the missions. Oh, okay, okay. You know, a lot of it, like the Lubo family of the of the Cahuilla, the Lubos got their name from the Lubo, me the Mexican, well, Spanish, and then later Mexican land grant that they worked for down in Riverside. And so a lot of the names were given to them by the missions. Uh, it's, it's an interesting story there on it because, and a lot of them took different names, you know, Based on what they were, they were doing, they were given names from their their jobs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to what to relate to the owner of the company? Or? Well, the, the companies, for instance, the Liverpool Salt Works down. It was in the bottom of the Salton Basin before the Salton Sea came in. Um, he he had the big salt mine. Well, most of the people that worked there were Kawia, and a lot of them had the same names. So what he did is he gave each of them a different name so that he could tell one from the other. And a lot of those people still go by the names that he gave them. Yeah. Is that their last name or their first name? Both. Okay. Um, he would, would change names around so that he knew where they were. And that's also an interesting story too. 
because he owned the salt mine down there. He had made a lot of money, and he invested his money into property in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. In 1905, mm -hmm. the river flooded, and his salt mine got flooded, and in 1906, his property got torn up by the earthquake. I mean, that was a bad couple years. Yeah, that's going from riches to rags in two years. What are the yeah. stories I read? But, uh, Did you write, have you written, I know you've written quite a bit, especially for the... Uh, Historical Society of the Old West. Yeah, I, I keep keep stuff on it. I'm working on one right now. What are you working on? On the village of Taki over on the side on the backside of Santa Rosa. How are you do? Are you on? Are you handwriting it? Or are you? No, I put it on the computer. Okay. But. Uh, um. Who language? Do they they don't do they use the language? Most of the language is gone. Some people are interested in it again. Sandy worked with Alvino Siva teaching the Mountain Cahuilla language on the different reservations. That notebook there is um, all Cahuilla lesson plans. And I saw it on the Facebook. And I, uh, I also was allowed to take Annie Hamilton's uh, le family lesson over, but I don't speak any, I have trouble with English. So, but uh, there's another group now down at Torres Martinez. They are teaching some of the language again down there. Mm -hmm. But uh, it goes in fits and starts. You've got a lot yeah. of kids that are interested, and then they get started, and then the kids aren't interested anymore. Yeah. Uh, there's they been don't a have to stick to it as much. But right now, there's a group down there that seem to be interested again. I do have a, uh, this white rooftops of early Palm Desert, I have to say that I, f I get a vision of that in my mind, almost like birds, you know, because of white birds down there. So do you remember, like, looking down? At yeah, you could see all when you were going down 74. Really? Because most of those were flat roofs. Yeah. So they really stood out with, uh, d on the desert with a big white patch down there, and especially you would have eight or ten houses in a row with white roofs so you could you could see them very plainly coming off the mountain so were those the dolomites yeah and did were the did dolomite have a were they large sheets or how no it's just chunks oh chunks that they put up there uh, different different uh, from about pea gravel to uh, oh, regular I gravel see. And oh, it's basically is that what that the tar is? that makes the roof and then the gr the rock is put over on the, while the tar is hot, and that keeps the tar from getting uh, blown away. Oh, uh, so. I never realized that. So mm -hmm. when you see like that white gravel, that's mm -hmm. dolomite. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, when you used to come out here, you came out here with your grandmother. You My grandparents, yeah. Grandparents, and they they would visit Palm Springs, right? Not really. We did most of it in Indio. In Indio, there okay. wasn't. There was a Safeway in Indio, and my grandmother was a Safeway fan because <laughs> there was a Safeway down at the bottom of the hill from where she lived in L.A. Their house was in L.A., oh. so she was familiar with Safeway. So when we did our shopping, it was to go down to the Safeway, and then that way we also saw the Detweilers when we were down there. I see. And then I don't know the connection to this day, but my grandfather. Uh, knew, what's his name, the artist down here. Uh, Bray? Hmm? Carl Bray? Carl Bray. Uh-huh. So we would stop and visit Carl Bray. Uh -huh. And What was that like? I was just a kid, yeah. uh, so I didn't know yeah. what was going on, but somehow he and my grandfather knew each other. Where did he, where was that, or what location? At, you know, it's now Indian Wells. The so there was a, stru there was a little Yeah, he had his art studio down there. He lived by himself? He was only by himself when I was there, but so I don't know. But you know, we were there with his art studio, and not at the house. So, but uh, was was his art? Was, how big was the art studio? Not a very big place. No, he used to sit out do his paintings, just like the one down here when we used to come out of Palm Springs. There was a great big corral down there, which uh, when they ran cattle. Down there, they had a big corral. Later, it was used for rodeos and stuff. And then, 
I guess it was Carl Itell and his girl would, would be sitting out there in the desert with these easel and paint brushes and everything and we'd go by. And we'd usually stop and my grandfather uh, would strike up a conversation and they seemed to know each other too. So I don't know what, what the deal was on that. Your grandfather sounds like a real great uh, guy. Was what was a, his name? He was a very personable people and a person yeah. and had a lot of friends. What was his name? Harry Caldwell. So I'm named for him. What happened with the Quinn? Uh, that's my middle name. My grandfather oh, Quinn. Okay. My grandfather Quinn was Port Morton Earl Quinn, mm -mm. and I ended up being Harry Morton Quinn. So, named for my two grandfathers. Oh. Yeah. Um. The summers in Alaska, how many summers did you spend in Alaska? I put in nine summers doing field work, one part or one month of one summer sitting on a drill rig, and a little over a month one winter sitting on a dr on two drill rigs. What was, the, what was the winter like? The winter was, it was, the most I had was 46 below. But it was, I had two different rigs I was sitting. So I lived at one rig and every day I had to fly twice over to the other rig to get the information, bring it back, and send it back to the office. What kind of people were working on the rig? What were these people? Uh, some of them were Native American, some of them Eskimo, uh, some of them you know, just Caucasian that worked up on the rigs. Did they make good money working up there? I'm assuming. I have no idea on that because I was just the geologist and went back and forth. What, what, kind of, what kind of a task did you have as a geologist? What would uh, you? Well, to keep tabs on the what was coming up out of the well bore. Mm -hmm. uh, they were looking for oil, right? We were looking for oil or gas, yeah, either one. So, but mainly is to look at the rocks coming up because I had spent my life looking at the rocks and outcrop. So now my job was to look at the rocks that we were drilling in and what did they look like from the rocks on the outcrop. So you know what you get some idea what you're drilling in mm -hmm. on it. So it, it was interesting. We had, a, you know, the ice strips. Uh, the air, air strip was nothing but water sprayed on the tundra. And then when it froze good solid, then they bladed it off with a grader, motor grader, and that became the runway. And then the road from the rig down to the runway was also just graded ice. So the new road had a nice curve to it that went down to the runway. Who made that blooper? Uh, they made a right angle? I have, I have no <laughs> idea. So, somebody didn't have, know what they were doing. But it was interesting because I had a um, little otter, single engine otter, that was flying back between the two rigs of us. Well, an otter is really nice because it's a turbo and you can reverse the prop. So you come in on the ice strip, reverse the prop, stop very nicely and pull off. And it had to go into town for uh, maintenance so they sent up a Cessna 172, which doesn't can't reverse the prop on it. So we went from the rig over to the other rig, and we hit the runway on the ice, and the pilot tapped the brakes, and we did a 360, and went right down the runway as though nothing had ever happened. Uh, and when we finally stopped and came back, the guy in the tower was just totally upset because he saw what happened, and he, and he you know, and on it. So after that. We didn't hit the brakes. We took a lot of runway to stop that plane. And it was, yeah. am it was amazing to see a big Herc come in with a load of drilling mud, set down on the runway, reverse the props, and stop. And this little Cessna 172 come in and used 4,000 feet of runway in order to get stopped. <laughs> so I was, yeah. sure glad, I was sure glad when my otter came back. <laughs> <laughs> that is really funny. Mm. Isn't he a great historian? Oh, I know it. I know. Yeah, I've gone down in three helicopters and two fixed ones. You have? Mm -hmm. Only one was totaled. What yeah. happened to you in the total? In the total, what happened? Did oh, you? I hit my head, but I because I was safe any place else, it would have hurt. Yeah. And the, you were, yeah. the other two went in the hospital, but I was released. He's got. He's like a cat himself with all those lives. Yeah. Well, I lost the crew. One helicopter went down, killed three of my geologists and the pilot. So that's what it's like, though. I mean, yeah. uh, um, 
what was it like? Like, what, what did you eat out there? What kind no, we had standard food. We had a cook. You did? Did you have yeah. a lot of fish? Or? Well, we had a lot of fish. Yeah? But that we caught. You know, and the, the fish up there was out of this world. I bet yeah. it was. You know, lake trout, grayling out of the creeks. A lot of, we had a lot of grayling for breakfast. Lake trout were mainly for, for dinner. Cause they were big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what are the people like that live in this area? In this what, area? Yeah. What would you? How would you describe? Today, I can't tell you, because <laughs> I don't have much to do with any of them. Uh, it was a completely different thing when I was growing up, because everybody was a friend. Everybody mm -hmm. stayed pretty much to themselves. They didn't interfere with other people. But if somebody had a problem, everybody was there to help. And uh, it was left over, I guess, from the cattle country because I have a good friend in southeastern Colorado. Um, he's a cattle rancher. There's basically nothing out there but cattle ranches. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing out there. If he has a roundup for his cattle, everybody comes over and helps him. Yeah. If somebody else has it, you go over and help them. And nobody's got their hand out for money. Um, you know, I just did this for you. Yeah. Uh, it, the world is not the same place I grew up in. Thank goodness I grew up when it was what it was. So is there any, do you know anyone in the area? Oh no, yeah, we Lisa over here. Yeah. Um, we know her. Do they uh, have a mayor or anything like that? No, not that I know of. We have a uh, group of property owners, the Opinion Pines Property Owners Association, but that's basically just for where I live. I see. It's, it's over there, and we have the Opinion Pines Water District, which also has monthly meetings. Um, you go to those? Sometimes, if they tell me about them. Yeah. I, don't, I don't keep up with what's going on. This is the city, right now we're in the city of? There is no city. I mean, it's unincorporated, right? Yeah. Unincorporated Anza or unincorporated? No, Anza's over the hill. This is unincorporated what, yeah, Riverside County? Or? It's all Riverside County, but oh. you're, you're at this, this, I'm not quite sure. I think this is still put into Pinion Pines. I think it goes all mm -hmm. the way to Jeroboa. Uh, then there's the Alpine Village is uh, the one out here, and then Pinion Crest over here, and then um, uh, Wilson Hills Forest Springcrest over there, and then there's another one farther down by Black Hill. Uh, there's a, another little group of houses back in there. They're just all individual. Mm -hmm. what, how, what are the plots? Are they like, are they five acres? Or um, she's on a one acre oh, you're here, on a one, yeah, you're and I'm, on, I'm just on a lot over there. I see. So it's quite very vari quite variable. So what, have you seen any recent uh, changes in the area that you were that surprised you? Like, I was surprised at some of the little McMansion kind of things, you know, the big houses that they're building. No, because um, you've got, uh, the big thing is up here is a lot of those big houses we haven't figured out because they come up here, they build them, they're there for two years, and then they're up for sale. Um, That's a good point. I, see I don't know what what the deal is, whether they don't like it, they got moved on their job or whatever happened, but they don't stay that long on the big houses. The smaller houses has been in the same position for yeah. God knows how long, so I don't know what's going oh, on. Oh, how interesting. And the other interesting thing is the people come up here and they get a house and they build a barn and they put in a corral and they have horses, and six months later they don't have any horses. Because uh, they don't, I don't know anymore? Oh. I've never figured it out. It's like they came up here, they were going to do all the stuff with their horses and then found out it was had to haul hay or had to do oh, something so they, else. they typed and into a dream. So, yeah, so they, their dream died and they just <laughs> gave up. But you'll see all kinds of homes around here with the big barn. And, uh, they're not barns, what do you call them? Stalls. Uh -huh. Stalls and... And, uh, and railings. Yeah, and there's yeah. no horses anymore. Somebody has a horse because when I walk to the mailbox, there's every now and then there's uh, hoof prints on the old trail over here. So there's somebody still riding around, but not very many. Do uh, they have any goats up here? Not many. Well, yeah, Whitsuring has goats. 
Twyla has goats. So I don't know what else she has. She's she's our farmer. She's she the organic farmer? No, she's she runs cattle. Still runs cattle up here. She and her cousin? Yeah. Cousin. She and her cousin. Um, they're from the Wellman family that had the ranch here when I was a kid. And well, they that, that name is, is around Palm Springs. I don't know if it's just a uh, could be. I don't know on that. But the, the Wellman family were early pioneers up mm -hmm. here. And Jim down here, uh, Margaret was his daughter and Bud was his son. Twyla's Bud's daughter and Ruthie is uh, Margaret's daughter. So they would be cousins. And they're the, they, they still run cattle. They have their, still have their rights down in Palm Canyon. And they run their cattle down there. So they're the only ones really left in the cattle business. And mm -hmm. Few of them on the reservation have their own cattle. But basically, cattle's gone. What well, about chickens and... Few people have chickens. Mm -hmm. So we had, Lady Ovira had a peacock. But <laughs> I think it what became, it, it jumped the fence and I think it became coyote food. So... Well, the last we saw of it, it you ran right in front of yeah, us. Yeah, almost we ran over it. Aww. Cricket. Yeah. Mommy stole your chair. Well, I moved the chair back mm -hmm. because oh. I, she was asking. <laughs> she was she asking for you. Okay, I think uh, I'm, I would like to know um, what advice you have to give to people who are, you know, college, because you've taught college. Yeah, I taught. COD and Cal State San Bernardino. How long did you teach at COD? I was at ni 18 or 19 years. Really? You were yeah. that, what was your, you were Geology. Then I taught Cal State Main Campus and Cal State Palm Desert Campus Geology. And then I taught Champ uh, Chapman University Geology there for a while. So was that one Fullerton, you mean? Or the one, mm, there's a, there's a no, it was out this campus. way. Yeah. yeah. So. Do you have any advice? For young, young and coming up. Not really. <laughs> Not in today's situation because yeah. I don't know. You know. Uh, Do you feel lucky that you lived in the time frame that you did? Yes. Very oh lucky. boy, uh, and how? So, <laughs> you know, you become a geologist now. You're an office person, basically. Yeah. Uh, well, I became a geologist because I didn't like office people. I see. Uh, so yeah. that was one of my re main reasons is was to get out. I sat wells, mm -hmm. even, even out of the office down here. We were drilling in Bakersfield or out in Nevada or anywhere. Um, I would go out and sit wells. Cricket is demanding oh your yeah. attention. Okay. <laughs> I, would, I would sit wells, and it was funny when I got to working for Tenneco in Denver. Yeah. You were supposed to sit your own wells. Well, mine were over on the western front, uh, eastern Utah, western Colorado. But there was a lot of drilling going on up in North Dakota that belonged to other people in, in the office. But they didn't like to go up because the wells were out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. and uh, I couldn't have a good time. It was cold weather. Mm -hmm. And so I made the mistake one day. Uh, well, actually, was I'm glad I did. But I made the mistake one day at lunch, and I said, well, you know, cold weather up there is, is nothing compared to up in Alaska. And I said, when I sat wells up there, and I said, and they were, you talk about being away from anybody, there wasn't anything up there. So somehow they went in and they said, okay, Harry you, go said he would go. you go sit my well. So I ended up sitting wells in North Dakota. No but when you went to something like that, did you have a crew with you? Or no. Any? Really? No. There's a mud logger on every rig and uh, who runs the equipment and takes the samples. And all you do is, is call in every morning on a morning report of what's happened and what you're drilling in and all of that type of stuff. And so that worked out really well for me because instead of sitting in the office, I would be two weeks out on a rig in North is Dakota. Is that what it took, two weeks out there? Usually two weeks, two weeks in. So, but. Yeah. I enjoyed learning about you so much. So, when I went to the Arctic, it was a month. 
Yeah. So that we wouldn't have to go back and pull things. How did you get to the artist? How, I mean, fly up. Fl from L.A. Yeah. I go to s from L.A. to Seattle, Seattle to Anchorage, Anchorage to Fairbanks, and then take a small plane out of Fairbanks up to the ridge. How long did that? How long did it take in there? Uh, several hours over the train track to get to them. Was the there? There's a camp already set up. Yeah, the camp's there. already set up. You just get there. So, yeah, I got pictures on the computer okay. when we were living at Saguan. I'm surprised now because I, I put in the computer Saguan, and it's now a big hunting, fishing camp. Oh. When I was there, it was a few trailers and an airstrip. <laughs> and that was there it. There's a lot of, uh, my neighbors, I actually, ha I'll tell you in a minute, uh, but I have neighbors that some of these places are getting, uh, got, they have like country clubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Californians are coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought if I ever find out who is up there, I might send them some pictures and say, here's what Saguan looked like when it was first started. Cause I'll have to write that. It, it was a geophysical camp that uh, they had to have the runway, so they went over on the side of the Saginaw River, and they had three camps, Sag 1, Sag 2, Sag 3, and Sag 1 became Saguan. Oh, is that and the right? other two were uh, let go, and so they maintained the runway and everything at, at Sag Saguan. So, I, so, yeah, you being a big kitty. <laughs> <laughs>